the road to Diamond 1 continues in Season 17 of Master Duel. Before I get started into the matches, make sure you check the description for the decklist video if you're interested in putting this deck together or learning a little bit about why we play certain ratios. That will be all explained in that video. At the end of the video, I will also be going over like the deck profiles of my opponents that I played against, and I will be covering my loss to a certain extent in this video though. Again, the timestamps will show where the matches start. I'll be going over the four wins. Uh, so far, you know, the deck has been doing quite well. Um, you know, nine matches played, only one loss, eight wins. And out of all five matches we played in Platinum 4, we only won one coin toss. We lost the other four. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these matches now. All right, this is going to be an interesting match. We're starting off with quite a banger, in my opinion. We are going second, and our hand is actually insane, but it would be insane to go first with. We just have to hope that we can play. So the opponent it reveals that they're likely on tier limit, pitching the newly limited King of the Swamp, grabbing a Polymerization, activating Scream, and Sharon. So they got a pretty strong opening hand for a tier limit player. The mill three reveals that they hit a Shuffler and uh, a name in the Havness, as well as a Kaiju, which is an Aqua. So they have double Fusion Material and double Aquas in the graveyard, and a name and double Shuffler. I'm at least thankful they don't hit a mill five in the Agito or Kelbeck, so I'm actually okay with this. Now they're going to trigger the Havness Fusion and Scream. So Scream resolves first, potentially giving them more material to fuse with, but they don't really need it, honestly, because like I said, they got two Aquas already. The Havness resolves to bring Kit Talos to field, and off of their Scream mill, they obviously mill pretty insane. They mill another name in the Sharon, a Cyberstein, which is broken, and a Mudora. So they got double Shufflers. Again, I'm just thankful, no Agito, no Kelback, because as soon as they mill five from my deck, they know what I'm on. That changes their decision making. They likely go for Dragos to Palea, Sulik, and things like that. Ironically enough, the opponent off kick Kalos grabs Sulyak. So we know Polly and Sulyak in hand. Do they have Murley or Rhino Heart in hand already? I guess not. The Sharon that they left in Graveyard is what they bring back to field to trigger Kit Kalos. So I just have to survive one more mill five, hoping for no Kalbeck or Agito. What do they hit? Pretty good for me. Just another Mudora. Nothing of uber significance, thankfully. Um, but hey, they hit two names and, you know, their first couple of mills were absolutely insane. So, I mean, you know, I got to get a win sometimes. They're going to opt to Xyz summon with the Sharons, which I, I, you could say is questionable because they have Sulik in hand. But it's not really because all it takes is for them to, you know, detach, trigger the other Sharon, and they can bring out Rukalos. They can preemptively trigger uh, a Shuffler, put back Kikalos, bring out Kikalos again for a free search. But the key here is, what is this other card in their hand? Is it a Havness? Is it a Rhino? Is it a Murley? Probably not Murley or Rhino because they would have used it in conjunction with the with the Kit Kalos that they had. So this is the kind of thought process you have to think through. The opponent lets me get to main phase one. Obviously the standby phase are gonna go ahead and, and attach. Now they know we're on Flow on Deries. The first thing we do is activate Fissure. Why? Because in case they do wanna trigger uh, Redo or early, you know, it'll still send the Sharons to Grave. But if they bring out Rukalos, if they try to activate Scream, by the time the chain resolves, uh, Fissure will be live. So Scream effect will be new chain link. It'll banish whatever they try to mill. So we want to prevent the Scream mill, um, even if they bring Rukalos to field in response to us activating Fissure. Okay, then we go ahead and activate Duality. Duality bricks pretty much. Extravagance is useful until our next turn. Uh, Dreaming Town is something we would activate, or sorry, not activate, search off of Empin since we already have a map and unexplored wins in hand. And DD Crow isn't live because of Dimensional Fissure. Part of DD Crow's effect, or sorry, cost is to send to Graveyard, which we can't do because of Fissure. Why do I take DD Crow? Two reasons. One, if they do get the Kaleido to hand, or sorry, uh, Rhino Heart to hand to make Kaleido, uh, let's say we send the known Sulik here off of Unexplored Winds, they search Rhino, and then off of Sharon Fusion, they bring Kaleido to spin back the Fissure. That makes our Crow Life for an interruption to set up our board so we can always beat over the Kaleido Heart so it doesn't get its effects back. Um, and the other reason is, you know, if we do end up keeping the Fissure on field, at least we can potentially put the Crow back with Unexplored Winds for a free draw if we don't end up needing it or we get into a sticky situation. Off of map, it took me a little while to decide what to do, but I go ahead and reveal Robina, obviously, to banish Eaglin. Why? Because off of the Robina, I actually want to search Toucan, and this is going to set up an interesting play. So this requires a little bit of advanced thinking. The opponent is smart here in activating Redoer in response to our Eaglin summon, because obviously they can't do it mid-chain, in which case the Unexplored Winds effect would be applied to tribute off the uh, Redoer. Not super significant, it means they would lose the Redoer, but they would still get the Sharon effects. So, uh, you know, this scenario just means they get back the Redoer, which again isn't a big deal. So. 
Off of Eaglin Resolve, we are now going to Empin Tribute off the Trap card. Now this is questionable, but this is my thought process here, right? If I don't Tribute off this Trap card, the Sharons are going to resolve and likely bring a Tier Limit name to the field. Probably Rukalo, so that their Sulek is live to negate an effect. If they do that, um, that is going to threaten me more because of the Sulek being live, in my opinion, than them searching for a Rhino and getting Kaleido on field to out the Dimensional Fissure. Was I right? Was I wrong? I don't know. We won't know, right? Because, uh, you know, we don't know what the other scenario would have would have uh, caused to happen. So chain links are going to resolve. The opponent has chain link uh, three and four, so their effects are going to resolve first. Off of the Sulek, they opt to bring Havnus, so not the Rhino Heart, which I found interesting. And then off of the Fusion for Sharon, they're going to go into Dragos to Palea. Makes sense. It's a good interruption against Flo Andres, obviously, so we have to out this. But again, knowing having their effects resolve first and knowing what they go for is important and it's going to dictate what I do. So you're going to see me search for Advent of Adventure off of the Empin and then choose not to summon off Empin. Why? Because if you look here, I still have my normal summon for turn right here, right? Normal summon for turn, still live. I'm going to choose not to summon off Empin, now activate Advent of Adventure, banish Empin and bring another Empin. Why? Because I'm going to normal summon for turn, apply the effect of unexplored winds, tribute the Eaglin, and tribute the Dragos to Palea, or technically it's sending it, it counts as a tribute summon. The send of the Dragos to Palea will get banished thanks to the uh, D Fissure still being up, and off of this Empin being summoned, we are now going to be able to search Trap, as well as continue summoning and now use our Toucan to bring back our banished Empin off of Advent of Adventure, then apply unexplored winds again, tribute off the Toucan, and the opponent's Havnus that they chose to bring to field, which will get banished, to bring out that Empin and search for another Advent of Adventure. This ends us on Trap Card, Advent of Adventure, and Double Empin. Ends the opponent on Polly in hand, Scream on field, Defissure on our side still up, and Mystery Card, I think, still in hand, right? So it leaves us in a super strong position. Yes, the opponent gets their Time Thief Redoer back, but we're not worried about that because we have Trap Interruption and uh, Map still for their turn. Defissure is still alive and Unexplored Winds is still going strong. So whatever the opponent mills here gets banished. They mill three monsters. That's a Rhino out of rotation, a Mudora out of rotation, and a Maxi. So they mill nothing to the graveyard, no spells and traps. And you know because everything was monster-based, they lose it thanks to Defissure. So it puts us in a super strong scenario, and I think the opponent realizes what's up, and they just scoop. So that's how we won going second against Flo against the tier limits with Flawanderies. Let's go on to the next match. All right, probably not too much to say on this one. Our opening hand again is pretty good to go first, but again, we're going second, so that's how it goes. The opponent does open up D Fissure, which is good for us, um, and a set face down card. So it looks like they don't really open anything uh, like engine wise to set up. So I'm thinking like, are they on also? Are they also on Flowandries and just bricked? Are they on Exo Sister uh, or on some other kind of rogue deck? So upon Pot of Prosperity, uh, we're gonna grab Eaglin and the opponent just decides to scoop. I don't know guys, it seems like the game really does want me to lose because I'm losing every coin toss. At least we open up evenly matched though. So let's see what happens here. Uh, we also open up the one of DD Crow. The opponent starts with normal summon Rhino pitching Sharon. Four other cards in hand. We're just gonna go ahead and stop the, the Sharon fusion. Um, and I'm gonna put them on, you better have something else. Cause if your first play is normal summon Rhino, I'm guessing you're kind of desperate. No scream, you might have like Soleic or something and we're gonna evenly you so. Uh, the opponent just scoops off that, like, so I'm like, okay, fine, we take those, uh, on to the next match, I guess. All right, the one coin toss that we won in this entire run in Platinum 4 was against Numeron, which, if we would have lost, would have made us go first anyway. So, we start off with a shifter after we activate duality. Just remember that you have to do that, because if you let duality resolve, it goes to graveyard, now your shifter is offline. So this hand does seem like a brick. The reason we activate duality first is just making sure that we don't need to use Gold Sarcophagus to banish Robina if we draw, if we excavate like uh, terraforming a map, a Robina, or a second bird or something. So we do have to use Gold Sark in order to banish Robina. And I talk about this in my decklist video, which I link in the description. Um, this is this is like literally what the video I made the other day, where I was like, you open up Gold Sark and uh, a Stree, which is you know the worst bird to open but it unbricks your hand and that's what you're going to see happen here. So the Stree is now going to be able to resolve by banishing, um, it has to banish the Shifter, I guess, because everything else is getting banished because of Shifter. 
Um, and then we bring Robina back to hand, summon Robina. Of course, bring Eaglin, Eaglin, search for Empin. I make a huge misplay here. This is what happened. This is like my, what was this? My second Solandry's match or something. Um, Cause I've been playing like other decks on other accounts and stuff. I'm thinking like, oh yeah, let me do that like cool, neat play where I bring Advent of Adventure and like grab Toucan and play off map. And I was just like, was thinking too fast. And I didn't realize like, oh my God, this is my normal summon. So I can't actually like activate this bring map and yeah, I'm kind of screwed. So my only play now is like, I have to bluff. So I play the Advent and I banish the street to grab map. And I'm like, okay, if they normal summon, at least I'll still get my interruption. Um, it's obviously not as good as the Dreaming Town, but it's better than nothing. So they know I have Eaglin in hand and we have a Book of Moon set, which we're bluffing to be the uh, Loandry's Dreaming Town trap. So the opponent opens up a Pot of Desires, which is pretty good. They're going to get a free draw too. Then they're going to Regeki the Empin. I'm like, okay, this is all fine. Everything's still getting banished because of Shifter. So that makes things easier for me. Um, and then they just pass. My guess is because, I, I you know, obviously I didn't know the deck that they were on at the time. My guess, my guess is because they didn't want a normal summon and commit into uh, Magnificent Map. And they also think that we have Dreaming Town set still. So they're like, well, he has two interruptions. I don't even want to let him play through my turn. I'll just wait. So I'm like, okay, draw into D Fissure. That's pretty good. I'm like, obviously they're either hurting because of banished cards. Um, and so D Fissure there is actually super strong, but it's weird, right? They're playing Pot of Desires and Raigeki. So I didn't actually clue in at the time, but I, I obviously know this is not tier limits. And I'm like, I wonder what this deck could be. Didn't even clue into me that it was going to be Numeron. Um, but anyways, now we can trigger map. You have all four birds into rotation. So we're in a super strong position at this point, And we're going to go ahead and bring Apex to field and just go through full rotation here. So nothing really to say. Um, the sequence matters a little bit. Again, bringing DD Crow where, when it's not live, just because what's the point of bringing another bird when we have all four in rotation right now? Not too much. Um, we're going to go ahead and bring out the Empin. Empin is going to go ahead and grab the proper Spell and Trap card now in terms of the Dreaming Town. We're going to normal summon Street, the opponent Nibiru's. Oh my goodness. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? Who's playing Nibiru in this format? So we eventually go ahead and uh, use the Unexplored Winds and bring out the Apex. At least, well, I guess, yeah, that kind of sucks, eh? Maybe I should have, maybe, I, yeah. I mean, I don't know. You can't read Nibiru, right, at this point in the, in the format. Because if I would have gone into Apex first and then used my normal summon for turn to go into Empin, uh, I would have been able to negate the Nibiru. Um, but yeah, that doesn't work out too well. So the opponent's back on five cards. They're going to draw for turn, um, but we are going to set the Dreaming Town. And once again, you know, pretty big back row commitment here. Um, playing into a duster pretty hard. The opponent starts with Kaiju over the Apex and then Lightning Storm wipe the back row. And at this point, I'm like, this has to be Numeron. Uh, so I go ahead and activate Dreaming Town and I go ahead and activate Book of Moon to flip the Kaiju face down because I'm like, if it is Numeron, I don't want them to get the damage beating into this. And I can bring Empin to field at least. And Empin can at least cut the attack in half of those monsters. And it's going to actually negate the monsters anyways, right? Because they can't activate because they're in attack mode. So we're going to go through full sequence once again. And this is why Flawandries is so good. Another reason why it shuts down Lynx, obviously, because of Empin. It's going to shut down things like Numeron. They have to out multiple Empins. And just the fact that you can recycle the Empins is very strong. Losing all of those spells and traps hurts, of course. We lost literally four of them. But this is the power of flow on Dreams. This is why I constructed the deck the way I did because I play for contingency. I play for the grind game, right? If you watch the deck list video, you see I play two uh, un um, unexplored wins. I play two trap off of the first Empin. I search for another unexplored wins. I don't need to bother recurring the one from the graveyard. Bring out the second Empin. What am I going to search for? Dreaming Town. The opponent's like, he has another double Empin. I can't play through that with Numeron and just scoops it up. So. All right, so let's quickly take a look at some of the deck lists of the opponents that we played in Platinum 4. The first duel that you probably saw is this one. We went second against Tier Limits, and uh, the, the opponent opened really strong. They had the potential to go Cyberstein into Exterio. They are playing the King of the Swamp package, which is now down to one as of the recent ban list with the Poly for the Guardian Chimera. And they're also playing the Mass Change package with the Dark Law for the Mirror Match. So very interesting. This guy obviously built his deck geared towards the Mirror Match. Um, so... Yeah, interesting list, uh, but yeah, we were able to overcome that one. Looking at the next one here, this is the opponent that opened up with the Fissure and the Set card. So a 44 card deck list and playing some anti-meta Mech Knight stuff, which is kind of interesting. Orcist, I'm um, not really sure what this deck does. 
Uh, but yeah, obviously when they saw we we, we part of Prosperity in, in, into Flawandry's cards, they scooped it up, realizing that the D Fissure wasn't going to put in work against us. The next opponent here, the only coin toss that we won, that you know even if we lost the coin toss, the opponent would probably would have made us go go first anyways. So it feels like the game is really trying to make me lose. I'm sure a lot of people feel that way at times. But a fairly interesting Numeron list. We got Nibiru by the one of Nibiru. We got Kaiju by the one of Kaiju. So that's kind of interesting. Um, I mean, I guess they are technically playing three different Kaiju. So it is what it is. Can't really complain. Um, but yeah, interesting list um, for Numeron. I personally wouldn't play a Numeron list this way. I have this deck in real life. Um, and I mean, I guess, you know, it's, it's format dependent. You're, you're playing in a tier limit format now in Master Duel, whereas obviously in, in the TCG, it's different. Uh, but yeah, we were able to overcome that Numeron list, and that one actually lasted a couple of turns. This is the opponent who Normal Summon Rhino dumped Sharon and then just scooped when I did decrowed it. So, I mean, you know, this is a pretty standard tier limit list, pretty strong. They're playing the Gravekeeper's Trap and Exchange of the Spirit package for the uh, Mirror Match. They're also playing the Diviner package with the Baron. So pretty strong stuff. And the Dugaris for OTK potential. So interesting list there by this opponent. I think they were probably just raging because I remember this guy was on his rank down match. He was probably just super frustrated. So as soon as he saw his, his uh, sharing get interrupted, he's probably just like, screw this, I'm, I'm leaving. Um, that, that gets to people at times, I know. And then uh, finally, the match that we lost, we did go second in this one as well. The opponent here opened the Busted Nuts. They started with Sharon pitching a Guido, and then that revealed to them that we were playing Flo Andres. They milled my one of map, they milled both of my tokens. Not off of this single Aguido, but off of Guido they did mill Kelbeck, and then Kelbeck triggered another 5 mil, and that's when I lost a lot of those resources. And then obviously, once they knew what I was on, they knew how to set up an end board. They went for the Soliac and the Dragostopalia. They also were able to mill another 11 cards on top of the 10 from the Aguido and the Kelbeck because they brought Murley to hand with uh, activating Scream and then Kikalo Send. Obviously, that's another 11 cards milled. They were able to set up quite a strong end board. They obviously had Scream Interruption. They made Elf uh, to bring back Murley for an interruption during my turn. That's mill six between Elf and, uh, sorry, not Elf, the Murley uh, being recurred by Elf and then Scream as well, triggering. And they also had a Havness in hand that they brought, I think off like Soliac Dump or something. So they had an insane, uh, insane turn one and we attempted to play one turn and we got somewhat far um, but you can see here that i resigned on turn three and the reason is because they also had triple tactics talent so when i uh attempted to do something on during their turn with the dreaming town when i was able to actually play through some of their interruption they just dropped the tactics talent took my empin and I, right there i was like yeah that's ggs so i ended up scooping so if you're interested in seeing some of my losses, let me know. By the time this video goes up, it'll already be a day past, so I won't have the replay. I'm not going to save it because I'm full. But, you know, I will be losing probably a lot of matches in the future. If you're interested in seeing those, let me know. But that's going to wrap it up for this video, guys. If you've made it this far, thank you very much. A comment and a like would be appreciated. And make sure you subscribe for more videos if you are interested in seeing more Master Duel gameplay with a variety of decks, not just full on. But that's going to do it. I'm going to sign off. Until next time, Quantum's out.